Hello everybody. Welcome back. Long time no see. Well, see for you guys. I just get to look at the camera. But uh, anyways, I think I did a shop update a few weeks or a month or three or six or a year or something like that ago. Um, I think I sat there and told you guys the pancake was done. The TA-152 was pretty dang close. Um, so that's kind of what the shop's going on here. I actually got a super secret project going on the, the 3D printer right now. So that'll be coming out probably early next year. Um, I just give you a hint, it's a jet. And it's not a scale jet, so. But your imaginations run wild. So, anyways, as far as the TA-152 goes, um, fuselage is done and molded. Let me bring you over here as y'all crooked. There's the fuselage. This is actually a, a, a cooling duct plug, mold, whatever you want to call it. That was 3D printed and I did a little bit of bodywork to it and painted some 3D print smoothing material on there from Smooth On. Turned out pretty good. I need to put another coat or two of that smoothing material on it and uh, that'll be ready to pop some parts off of. So the fuselage came out really well. I'm very impressed. The fuselage, as you see it, is five pounds and it's eight foot long. And at the biggest point, it's like 20 inches in circumference or something. It's ridiculously light for the size of it. Um, by the time you put the cowlings and all that stuff, which are right there behind the corner of that air filter that you can barely see. So by the time you put the cowling, the gun hood, the windscreen, the canopy uh, frame, and the horizontal stabs on it, it's eight and a half pounds. It's almost plus eight and a half, eight and three quarters, something like that, I forget. So it's, it's ridiculously light for the size of it. So I'm really happy with that. Uh, horizontal stabs, let me grab them, I'll show you guys. And it turned out pretty dang good. I'm impressed with those as well. So here's the horizontal stabs, two piece, so you can remove them with a aluminum tube to hold them together. All the structures pre-installed, and you can see I did the whole uh, Golden Gate Bridge structure on the inside of it. These things weigh like four ounces each, or it's not even that much. I think it's like three, three and a quarter. It, they're ridiculously light, so and they're extremely strong. Again, it's all my specialty foam from from Germany. Um, again, all the structures installed here, the hardwood block, everything. So all you really have to do is. Uh, drill the hole for the anti-rotation pins, drill your holes for the attachment bolts, and glue in the hinges. That's it, then these are done. And ready for paint, basically, as they come out of the mold. And you can see the level of detail to it. So, I mean, I, I put everything. And the little screw heads, those are actually screws. They're not screws in this, but they were screws in the plugs. So, uh, <laughs> I probably spent $200 on a little bit of brass screws. So, tail section molds are done. All the fuselage mold stuff is done. I gotta finish the, uh, I gotta finish making the, the structure to support the, the vacuum form for the, for the canopy. But essentially all the fuselage stuff is done other than doing bulkheads, which I've got the vast majority of that stuff done. Uh, the last ones that I have to do are for actually attaching the wing to the fuselage. But um, this is just kind of like a prototype uh, fuselage. I haven't decided if I'm going to use it or not because there, there are some little imperfections that I want to fill in that I still need to sand down. So this may just be a, a quick and dirty fuselage to get it up and flying, and then I'll do a, a really nice one with all the. Well, the next one's going to be really nice in that almost all of the internal structure will be installed other than the wing attachment bulkheads, which that'll be left up to the to the owners to do. So yeah, that's the TA152. So, a couple of buddies have been asking about litho plate. Again, I litho plated all of the plug on the fuselage on this thing, as well as the horizontal stabs. And uh, because I did it on this, I have to do it on everything else. I have two sets of wings. Yeah, two. The first set are actually sitting up on a shelf right now and not doing me any good because as they're built, per the plans, they're wrong. And what I mean by wrong is the TA-152 has a very prominent kink in the trailing edge. It's not a straight trailing edge, as you would expect on a typical airplane. It actually comes out and then bends at a certain point. 
<coughs> the plans built wings actually have that kink where the three piece option is and the split is. So while the kink is there, it's not it's not the correct location and it just it makes the whole thing wrong. So here I have the newest set of wings which I completely redesigned. So essentially everything about the Don Anderson plans that I began to use, the only thing that's the same is the paper. Everything else is different. So you can kind of sight down through here. You can see, if you look down the trailing edge, which I know it's really hard on the video, but you can see how the wing tip out there is actually higher or lower, whichever one, is lower than out here. So you're probably thinking, well that means it has wash in. Typically yes, but in this instance, no. So the way this wing was designed in World War II is all of your washout goes from the center line root rib, and then it comes to two and a half degrees of negative here at this flap and aileron junction rib. So all of your washout is actually on the inside two thirds of the wing. The last two thirds of the aileron is maintains that negative two and a half degrees of incidence from the root of the aileron to the tip of the aileron. So while it gives you the illusion of having wash in, it's actually all washout. It's just that they put all of the washout further inboard on the wing and then carry that incidence angle to the tip. Very confusing. Why it's done that way, eh, we'll probably never know. But uh, my speculation is they wanted the inboard section of the wing to stall before the entire aileron. So what that allows you to do is it basically allows you to fly the airplane through a stall. So you can have the airplane stalled with full aileron functionality. So you can sit there and be stalling the airplane and still be able to roll in on your on your uh, on your opponent really kind of cool if, if that's actually the way it was designed and that was the intention <laughs> really interesting to think of them doing something like that in the 40s will we ever know if it was actually functional or effective probably not I mean, there's only one of these things flying there's only one person left in the world that I know of that's still alive that never flew one and it's highly unlikely he got this thing to the 36,000 feet or whatever that they were expecting to, to operate it at because this airplane was primarily designed to fight the V-29s that the Germans feared were going to come over to Europe, which never happened because the European theater ended before that happened. So, anyways, pretty cool little, it's amazing the things you, you learn and you kind of speculate on these airplanes as you build like a really scale model. So it's a very unique airplane, it's, it's really cool. So again, litho plating everything, you can see these are just kind of bare panels that I've been cutting out. Most of these panels are actually pretty easy. Let me zoom you guys back over here to the wing. So this particular panel is right here and it's got actually two little holes in it for, well, let me get where you can see it. This panel goes right here actually. There's two holes for aileron actuation leakage uh, attachment points on the real one. These actually get covered over with fabric for whatever reason. So basically, when, you're, when you need to cut a panel out that's like this, it's really simple. You just grab a piece of litho plate, and then I just kind of pick an edge. In this case, we'll use this forward edge here. Put it there, you make a couple registration marks, you do the same thing on the other line, then you just kind of cut it to shape till it fits. And then once you're done, you end up with a, the with a panel that actually fits the shape. And then in order to do the holes, I just use these little things. They're called plug cutters. <laughs> They're actually made for uh, for cutting like dowel wood plugs or something like that for cabinetry and stuff. I got these from Harbor Freight. I think they were like three dollars or something, which is exactly why I got them from Harbor Freight. They're cheap, and I'm not using them for cutting wood. I'm cutting, I'm cutting metal with them, so they the ends of them get eaten up pretty quickly. But um, they don't. Let me pull one out here. You can see it's not in a, a complete circle. There's actually that little break in it uh, right there. So what you have to do is you kind of have to like put it on there and tap around it a couple of times and spin it and tap around a couple of times and, and you're good to go. And what I use for a backing board, just a bamboo cutting board. I think it's like four dollars or five bucks or something like that from uh, from Walmart. So the reason why I choose bamboo is because it has some areas that are a little more dense and 
less soft than, uh, than other areas. So in the, an area where you need a lot of depth for your rivet, you can pick a soft spot. And then when you want to cut something, like with a plug cutter, you, fit, you find a harder spot. So it gives you more of a, a crisp cut than it does just an indentation. So that's that part of working with lift mode. So that's pretty much predominantly what this video is going to be about, is just doing with their plating. And I'm not going to get too far in depth with it now because there's some pretty big panels on these wings that I need bigger sheets for. And I don't have them. i got to go pick them up Monday from a printing press. So bear with me. It's going to take a couple of days to get through all of this. So easy panels. Easy. And you're probably like, well, how do you figure out the lines? <laughs> Break out your three views and your, your scale calculators and start measuring. Typically what I do when I'm laying out panel lines is I pick a certain point at the fuselage and the wing junction, and I use that as a, basically a reference point for everything. Um, in this case, which you can't see it because it's on the wing center section, there's a prominent kink or a bend in the wing fillet from the fuselage where it blends into the wing. I use that one reference point and everything from that point out becomes reference off of that. And then once you get further out on the wing panel, it's, it's, it's not practical to use something that's, in this case, 70 inches away. So you kind of have to find a good reference point along that. So as long as you reference everything from that one point, if you take this panel line and essentially reference from this one, you should be fine. So it's, if you've laid out panel lines before, you, you, you have your own way of doing it. So it, that's just how I kind of do things. And then when you get the curved parts, it becomes very difficult. Like leading edges, for example. It's near impossible to have a leading edge, unless it's a straight, constant cord wing, that's easy to do litho plating with. Um, if you have a tapered wing, which is pretty much every fighter since like World War I, <laughs> you, you, you've got some it becomes a little more difficult. So that's typically what I'm gonna do here is just show you guys kind of how I come about getting these weird panels and stuff done. So what you need, wing with, tape, wing, uh, wing with your panel lines laid out, rulers, masking tape, ultra fine sharpies, pencils, whatever, box cutter for the sharp blade, or even a half weight gold blade, this doesn't really matter. And the biggest thing of tracing paper you can get so, I'm going to take out a piece of tracing paper here. And this is where, if you can get tracing paper that's the same size as your litho plate sheet, that makes your life even easier. And I'll explain why here in just a moment. So, here's a piece of used litho. You can see on the back of it kind of how it has ink around the edges. So, you know, it's been used. And you can see my tracing paper is pretty dang close to the same size. Not quite as long, but it's a little shorter. Or a little wider, actually. So then you also see kind of how like, it has dent to it in places. It doesn't really bother me because it kind of adds to the effect of what you're wanting to look at. But you also see how the, the ends of it are kind of bent up and stuff. So I just get rid of, the, rid of the ends. And in order to do that, Break out your regular old paper cutter. Yeah, like what you see in your office, a paper cutter. Pick it up, stick it in there, just like it's a piece of paper. See how easy that cuts? Just slices and dices right on through. It's like making julienne fries with a paper cutter. So, <laughs> anyways, cut the ends off of it. Gives you a nice square piece of litho plate that you can use. Downside, you lose a little bit of material, but it's got a bunch of holes in it anyway, so who cares? All right, we'll put this up. This is gonna be a long video, so grab a seat, a drink, or a beer, or my kind, whatever your favorite beverage may be. All right, so we got our litho plate sheet cut down nicely now. Now I need to decide what panel do we want to do. So typically when I get in weird shaped panels like this, I try and do multiples at once. And the reason I do multiples is because it lets you transfer the seam line where the two panels are simultaneously. So you get a really nice joint between those. 
So in this case, just take your litho panel and see what panel will work. In this case, I can do both of these panels at once. Again, this monstrous panel right here, I don't have a piece big enough for it. So we'll do that one once I get some more material. So now just take your litho plate, or your, I'm sorry, your tracing paper, and a little piece of masking tape, if I can find the end of it, there it is. And again, use the cheapest materials you can find for this stuff, guys. Don't go out and buy like three dollar roll of masking tape. Just get the El Cheapo stuff because you're just throwing it away. I think that masking tape came from Walmart. It was like four rolls for two dollars or something. It was like fifty cent a roll. It was ridiculously cheap. All right. So here, what we do is we're gonna mask our tracing paper and we're gonna have the back the edge of the tracing paper right along the panel line on the back side we want that gives us a nice edge there and I've got to overlap on both sides you'll see why in a moment as you wrap the paper around you'll notice because of the paper and now well, wrap the tracing paper around you'll notice because of the taper it skews over so if I hadn't have overlapped it I wouldn't have had it in the proper position for here so now what we'll do is we'll just use a piece of masking tape here in the back center to hold this nice and tight. Again, this is the bottom surface of the wing. You can see there's a ton of little round access holes in there that I get to cut out, which I'm going to do with the CNC router, see how that works out. Try something different on this one. Then take your, take your roller, black sharpie. I use three different color sharpies when I'm doing these things. And the reason for three different colors, I use black for cut lines, green for rivet lines, and red for reference, ref, eh, reference lines. Red for reference, black for whatever the hell I've decided to use it for. It's whatever. It's black. Yeah, so I used it both. Got it. All right. So here I'm going to make the back edge of this part, of that that, uh, that panel on, and just draw that on there. It's nice, firm. Ruler, then get a floppy ruler. Mm -hmm. and then I'll draw on the next one. Let me zoom it in so you guys can see what the heck I'm doing. Otherwise, you're gonna be like, "What? Well, I don't see nothing." All right, there we go. So I have the ruler and just transfer the line. Notice I'm not going all the way around the leading edge. I'll tell you why in a moment. Move it down. Ah, suck at this. There we go. I'll find it eventually. Then draw your next one. Boom. There's sound effects for you. And the next one. Alright. Maybe some of this crap out of here. Flip it over. Just zoom out a little bit more so you got. Oh, oh wait. You can tell I'm out of practice with this. It's been a while. All right, then we'll draw the next one. You'll also notice I didn't put a second. <laughs> this has only got like one plus well, two coats of primer. Uh, great thing about litho plating this stuff. It doesn't really care what the surface under it is. As long as it's reasonably reasonably smooth and reasonably flat, it doesn't care. It's not like flight metal where every little speck of dirt is going to show up in your finish. Alright, then we'll do the last one here. And again, I still have not transferred this around the leading edge. The reason why is because of the whole taper thing, the leading edge gets very difficult to do. Um, it's, it's actually kind of hard to do with the uh, when you're just laying out the panel lines. So typically what I do is when I'm laying out the panel lines, I'll use a, a laser level and I'll just shoot it right across. Like I'll draw the top line for the back side, the bottom line for the on the bottom side, and then I'll just make sure the, la the laser line stays right down in the center of that and I'll transfer it around. And then I'll just go through and I'll make a bunch of dots around the leading edge and then connect the dots, which is essentially what you'll... All you're going to do now is you're just going to trace the curve of the leading edge around. And this is the one I'd say, try to do multiple panels at once. 
makes it a little uh, a little nicer. Okay, there we go. Zooming you guys back out. Now we'll undo the masking tape so we can pull this off. There we go. Now you can see how they kind of take a curve around the leading edge. Now this is why we don't transfer just a straight line across. Because if you did the straight line across, you'd actually have a, a point in the center instead of a nice, smooth curve around. Point's no good. Curve much better. Alright, so there's that. Now we get to bring out our other tool. Scissors and an exacto. So to cut this one line right here, I'll actually use my exacto knife. Once I get it. Exacto. Again, I try and cut it to where I'm right down the center of the line that we drew on here. The reason why the center is because I want to leave a little bit of a gap when you put the panels on. That way you kind of kind of makes a little bit of imperfection into it by purposely putting imperfection in, if it makes any sense. Plus it was World War II. This thing was brought out like pretty late in the war. I think it was only in service for about six months before the war ended. So things weren't going to be perfect. All right, there's that. And then what we will do is we'll cut along the one edge higher. This end. That one. Go stop my paint from going my stuff around. There we go. That should make life a little easier. And then we'll cut the other side. All right, don't cut the middle, not yet. But why? Wait, I'll show you. <laughs> All right, bring out your litho plate, bring out your template, and then line up your template to an edge of the litho that is actually straight. You don't want to use a non-straight side, but if you want to, you can. It's just one more cut you got to make. So there, and then I'll just kind of tape everything to the table so it doesn't really move. Alright, break out your ruler and your box cutter. Line up your ruler to the edge of your tracing paper. I'm going to put my head in the way. Here, box cutter. Just swirl along the, the ruler's edge. You only got to do this three or four times using fairly light pressure. And then we'll see it. Every time I score it, it starts folding up. That's close enough. Good enough. It just folded me. Sit there and just kind of work it. And what you're doing as you're doing this is you're, you're work hardening the, the litho. Eventually, it'll break right along the line you score. Nice and perfectly straight, flat, linear, whatever you want to call it. All right, there we go. Now we're left with that piece. Now, 
take two more pieces of masking tape and put them on here to where they're almost at the edge as I screw it up almost where it's at the corner of where you're going to cut it I know you guys can't see this in very good detail but I'll show you here in a minute once I get it off the table and now where it was taped to the table you know how the template was taped pull it up wrap the tape on the template around the back side of the lift though ta-da now your template's perfectly aligned to the piece of lift that you just cut so that's what i mean by almost at the edge Any scissors again cheap scissors dollar ninety something Just cut this around the edge of your template. And whatever you do, don't fully close the scissors, because if you do that, you'll, you'll dip the litho. So you gotta make nice small cuts of it. There. See, that stuff cuts easy, man. And this stuff is so easy to work with. When you're doing flat panels like this, wait till you get the curved stuff. Then it becomes fun. Which, yes, I'll show you guys how to do that too. It's way more work to it. Way more work. So again, just cutting the ends. Nice and like you're supposed to be. Now you're like, oh, but there's two panels, not one. Easy. Just cut this line out. And when I'm going around the curve, typically what I'll do is I'll tilt the scissors over. That way it gives you a nice, smoother curve around the curve. Bam. Two pieces that fit together perfect. So now, if you're really good when you build your airplane or your plugs, you can reuse these for the other side. If it's actually perfect, which ain't no airplane perfect, so I don't expect yours to be either, because mine's not. But if you get lucky, <laughs> you can reuse it for the other side. So far I've gotten lucky on a couple of panels, but not very often does that happen. Especially with fuselages. Fuselages are really pain in the butt to get nice. All right, let me zoom in here for you. Wrong one! All right, there we go. Now you see, it's kind of got like some curves to it. Show you how to fix that. Easy! Oops. Bamboo cutting board. I'll pull this. Put your parts on your bamboo cutting board. Take a wooden dowel. Whew, that stuff's just there. Wooden dowel. <laughs> all you gotta do is just you gotta block the reflection because then you guys can't see anything. Just take the wooden dowel here on the edge and just roll it. You'll notice the wooden dowel, the ends of it are rounded. The reason why it's rounded because if you tilt it to one side, you're going to leave a crease mark down the middle of your, your litho. And not very scale looking to be honest. So there we go. Now you got two pieces of litho that joined up damn near perfect. So easy. And then what we'll do. We'll check to see how it fits against the wings. Right. Bigger wing panel. No, let's do the big one. Typically, I would take these on there and put these on and then wrap it around. But you can see, nice big fat leading edge. 
They just wrap around. Perfect. Perfect. And what you can do is you can actually, uh, if you got some small wooden dowels, or in this case, pretty large wooden dowels, like one or two inch wooden dowel, you can actually kind of preform it before you wrap it around. That way it doesn't want to pull away from it quite so much. So, all right, that's working with Litho 101.1. Um, again, there's a lot of this stuff to do. I got, I mean, it's 36 square feet of this stuff I got to do. And there's probably at least a million rivets on this wing by itself. It, it, well, it's probably not a million, but it feels like it. Uh, you see pictures of it, it's just rivet after rivet after rivet, especially the center section on the main spark. Holy crap. It'll be there for days. So, anyways, I'll upload this video later. Um, maybe if I get around to it, I'll get onto some of the more complex pieces like wingtips. With the compound curves, those are really fun to do, especially when they got a flat spot for a nav light like this one does. And uh, this particular panel here, according to all my three views, is actually one piece, which is actually I don't even think it's possible to do that without it, 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 putting in a manufacturing sense of doing it in like large volume. It makes no sense to do that one piece. So my thoughts are there's probably a, a scene here right in the center to where they just kind of joggled it and uh, it gives you a, an illusion of a, a flush seam well it gives you a flush seam but it's actually an overlapping seam so uh, that, that's my thought process on that and since these are going to be molded there's going to be a, a seam line right here down the center anyway so i'm going to do this in two pieces just to make my life way easier and i can just put the seam on the, on the side uh, the wing tip cap here that'll probably be one piece yeah one piece it, it's crazy it's one piece so it's possible. You just gotta be patient and get used to this stuff. It's, I learned a lot of things on the F-14 that I really wish I would have known when I did that compared to now. The, the, the TA-152 is giving me a lot nicer finish than the F-14, but it, it, it's almost, it's a little disheartening when I look at the F-14 in some areas that could have been better. So anyways, like I said, let's throw 101.1. Um, 101.2, I'll show some, I don't know, riveting or those curves or, or whatever. I'm going to finish making up all these panels and get that stuff done. Anyway, y'all have a good one. See you next time.